Hello and welcome everyone to the May 2022 edition of Integration Down Under. Um, let's go through a few of the slides to get started. It's, it has been a couple of months since we did it. We had we missed March and April. I apologize, but life caught up with me and us so trying to get things done. So we've got uh, the organizers, Martin in Perth, Dan in Brisbane, Mick in Sydney, Wagner in Auckland, and myself in Melbourne. And it looks like it's opening up. I've got my first sets of, of airplane tickets for flights in June. So getting back on airplanes, which that'll be interesting. And tonight we have John giving a talk on the, it's the same talk he did for his um, Global Days, Integration is Awesome. It's the extended version because I think he had 30 minutes for global integration. Now he has um, an hour tonight. So also post any questions you want to in the chat and I will um, give those to John to answer. So looking at all the different uh, integration services. So yeah, it's uh, it's good to have a review of all these things because it's surprising when I, would, I talk to clients about what is integration when, if they're used to biz talk and things like that, and what is integration when you talk about Azure and all the different pieces? Because there's no, no product called integration. So it's um, how you hook all of these other things together. So this will be good. Um, so let me just go ahead and um, flip over to John's talk. And okay, I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Integration Down Under. Um, my first talk at Integration Down Under. Been a, a person on the sidelines, if you want to call it that way, for a, a while. But it's great to actually be in front of um, and being a presenter for a change. So I'm John Beliris. I'm actually a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I've been there for um, roughly over two years. Today, I will be presenting a repeat of my Global Azure Days Integration is Awesome talk, but this time in 60 minutes. I won't be rushing it. I've got a bit more time. I'll be presenting the same slide decks, but I have made a change. So if um, someone's trying to compare the notes, there are slight, slight changes to the slide deck to, to allow me to actually go a bit deeper into some of these um, topics because that's um, what I missed out in the 30-minute um, version. So what is driving integration now? Um, when you first come in, and especially for me when I'm talking to customers that want to know why and how is integration, obviously this user group does integration all the time, but not all customers really understand what is driving it. And um, obviously the first one being modernization and just as our mobile phones like you know, everyone's got a smartphone whatever brand it is and we're all driving modernization as consumers so is the tech underneath it so the apps that are being used are changing they're going more and more modern and so these apps underneath need a whole range of different platforms underneath to provide that consumer experience so they're modernizing it obviously we've heard of kubernetes and the whole containerization drive across the industry of software development so while they're replacing all these old legacy platforms they're also going through and modernizing integration and that also leads into cloud adoption so that digital transformation that all these customers and companies are going through are being driven and they're also driving integration to change as well. So I still remember, and I've worked with lots of old companies um, that, you know, 80% of their integration was file transfer based that one per day, that overnight, classic overnight batch jobs, that's going away because we have that expectation of immediacy. So we sit there and on a website and do submit for an order. We expect that to go and take the money out of our credit card place the order and we get an order number and uh, an email of the acknowledgement of that order. So we expect all this integration to happen more or less in real time. There's no, you know, place an order and you know, you'll wait till overnight to get a response. That's 
gone away. So these are changing up. But going from the bottom up, we as developers are driving and pushing the boundaries of what is achievable. So we're looking at automating a lot more. And we're also bringing out a lot more citizen developers to actually do this business process automation to get away from all those manual type workflows that used to be there. So we're trying to push that, but obviously there is, and it always comes to be very, very clear that there is security and governance that needs to be put in place as well. And that's obviously, you know, as developers, we're moving as fast as we can, but obviously that needs to be kept into there. So we write our code securely in, in these guardrails or governance frameworks that are coming through. So what are Azure integration services? Now this um, deck actually puts them all together in one piece and it's the ready reckoner that I use when I have my own customer discussions. It is not one service as Bill did say, it is a set of services that allow you to put all these integrations of all these together. So we have logic apps, so obviously our workflow engine to do micro microservice and API orchestration. We have Azure Functions as our little I can't say little, but it's a very, very popular and <laughs> quite important brother in the serverless compute area. Also, we have API management. So the whole idea of API management is to manage and monitor APIs that you expose out to consumers. And by consumers, I don't mean you know just your average shopper. It'll be a consumer organization so we're talking b2b it can be b2c in scenarios where that that c actually happens to be a business that's providing another service onto you and there's some plastic mobile applications that do it that way where they actually take apis from different places and put them together to be consumed by someone on that mobile app but as the end organization i am providing let's say data of um speed cameras, for example, um, and that's being used by an app as well as other data to enrich it to provide you that. So that API management layer is there to actually allow that to be exposed in a controlled and monitored way. We have the two messaging platforms, so Service Bus and Event Grid and Event Hub. I should say there should be three, but I'll just put them under two. So there is a difference between them, and I'll explain that later. But so we do have Service Bus, which is our enterprise messaging solution, and we have um, the eventing delivery with Event Grid and Event Hub. And for large-scale ETL as a service, there's Azure Data Factory to assist um, in there for that kind of more traditional ETL or ELT type um, data movement. Importantly, when I do have my discussion with customers, um, I do point out that Azure integration services are in the magic quadrant. So if they want to know what it means, you know, like how does it compare with other platforms and services available in, in the industry, the magic quadrant has there, and it's been in there for, that's a six years inclusive. So it's actually doing very, very well. So is API management. That's also in the magic quadrant. And that's been there for two years. And a little nugget here on the side. Now we have all these services. So API management, app services, event grids, functions, and logic apps available to be managed and deployed using Azure Arc. Now that is an advanced topic. But it's actually important for those who are looking at a single pane of glass to be able to manage not just Azure-based services, but services based in other clouds and in data centers on-prem. So it gives you that one operational view. But that's a, a topic for another day. So I also get asked questions on why 
you know, so obviously the important parts here is um, it's a collection of services, but it's a best in class. And obviously this user group has been doing integration services for a very, very long time. So we know well, but it's just something we shouldn't lose sight of because it's important when we're going into and understanding what other products there are, there are products that do parts of this, but they don't do all of it. And you have to um, introduce other third party components. So the solution is not so gelled together. So this is a good, well gelled suite of services. There's a whole bunch of SLAs behind it and they're financially backed. So Microsoft does put their money where their mouth is, as the saying says. If the SLA is not met, um, Microsoft will reimburse you for that missed SLA. And there's no saying on anything we do, security has got to be there or in everything we do. So Microsoft is spending over a billion and that's growing in, with the amount of investments there are. So the foundations that these services are built on are secure by design. They put the DevSecOps as far left. So that's that, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, this shift left. So that shift left mentality. But on the other aspect, I have a lot of organizations asking me what compliance offerings does the platform have? So um, obviously go to Trust Center under the Microsoft site and have a look. There's a phenomenal number of them, uh, Australian, so the regional ones. And then there's obviously the global ones such as ISO and GDR. G. I can't say the acronym now. GDPR. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so let's go in a bit more deeper into each one of these. So Azure Logic Apps, obviously, it's the workflow engine. So a whole bunch of integration challenges can be made much simpler because there's 400 and something out-of-the-box connectors. So instead of having to figure out how to connect from a piece of code to a back-end database or to another third-party system such as SAP, the connector's already built for you. So you get this more pleasant experience. With Logic Apps, you're also able to connect and integrate cloud and on-prem. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in Azure. It could be another cloud. It can be on-prem. That's quite possible. And obviously, it's a um, it's a web-based workflow designer. So um, if you're familiar with this talk, like we probably all are, uh, you have that orchestration designer, you can um, use that drag and drop interface, uh, or this one, but you don't need anything like Visual Studio or anything. It is basically in the web. And also, I uh, should point out, you can do this in Visual Studio code. So it's... Um, uh, there's no need for a Visual Studio license. There's a whole bunch of classic examples that you can do with Logic Apps. So obviously we talk about um, scheduling email orders, like when you pa uh, purchase something on a e-commerce website. So that's a classic one. It can do FTP, so files come in, they can be moved to storage or to move to some other processing or that can even be parsed and broken up and um, debatched is probably the best word to use for those. And my favorite, and I will be um, demoing this kind of stuff, is sentiment analysis. So um, going and reading what's happening in the world of Twitter, getting the Twitter text, analyzing the sentiment into a class of how good or bad it is, and then from there on, you know, in my demo, I'll show you, it alerts me. So or we can do an action on it. So if there's some sentiment that needs to be reviewed because of a negative um, feedback from a couple of customers, you can actually watch that as well. Do get asked a lot on whether functions or logic apps. And um, it's a very common, very important question so the the two key things about azure functions are they are code it is still 
writing software, you're writing code to do your business logic. And it does support the most popular programming languages. I'm a C sharp .NET bigot, if you want to use that word. So it supports that one, but it's not the only, there's a whole bunch of other languages such as Python that are supported and, it, but you are still writing code. Whereas when you compare that with logic apps, it's a drag and drop interface. It's a lower code type solution. So you don't need to be writing a lot of code. You will have to write some expressions and there's some pain points with writing expressions, but the overall experience is drag and drop. So you get that. You get the 450 connectors. You don't have to write that SAP connector to get that document out of SAP. It's there available for you. And these connectors are maintained by the ecosystem. You don't have to worry about um, looking after them as well. I have got these two links in here. So this one from Microsoft actually talking about the comparison between functions, logic apps, and flow. That's a quite a common question. I was asked this question during the global days. So I got in there. But also um, uh, a well-known colleague of ours, Paco, actually has written an article and updated it uh, several months ago on this. So obviously he's got in his thoughts in there, which are actually quite true. So, um, so logic apps are better for B2B type integration solutions. They've got a whole bunch of um, built-in monitoring tools, but uh, with the logic apps and Azure functions with the standard runtime, you get that into App Insights. So um, we've got that quite um, a good AP application performance monitoring available as well. So do recommend reading Paco's um, article as well. API management. So it's basically a multi-cloud platform for managing APIs across environments and for different types of exposure. So, and why I mean it's multi-cloud is that it's now possible to host these APIs on-prem or in any other cloud, thanks to it being available as a container. So you can actually grab it and deploy it on-prem in a Kubernetes cluster, and it will be actually managed by APIM in the cloud. So you'll still define what you have to do, but the runtime of that gateway will be on-prem, in another cloud, or in Azure. So you still get that one pane of glass of exposing those APIs. So. The whole idea here is, and I've had to borrow these words from another uh, vendor for APIs, is that is democratizing your APIs, giving them out to people to be able to consume, to build better products. So it meets these challenges. You know, it abstracts what you've got in the back end. So you, your back end um, APIs, whatever they are, are abstracted and the complexity is not shown out to the real world. You're able to do this securely because APIM can also validate the tokens that's coming in. So if you're backing it with an identity provider, such as Azure B2C, you can actually validate the JWAT token for you. You can get the metrics, obviously, important. You know, It's no point in developing something and spending all that time and money if you're not able to understand your return on investment. That's a, from a business as well as from a technology standpoint, if an API is not being used, there's no need for the investment to continue. Or if it's being well received and used a lot, then you'll have to just make sure that you maintain and look after a life cycle, potentially um, provide much better documentation, which you should always do in the first place, but better documentation as well as enriching it with more features. So that's the beauty about API. I mean, it allows you that experience to expose your API safely. Messaging is a big topic. Um, so I will talk about Service Bus, Event Grid and Event Hubs. Relay, um, I won't talk about in this there, but it's, I'll put it in there in the slide for us to show the offerings that are available to be used as part of the integration services. 
So we have service bus, which is just your enterprise messaging type of um, scenario where you're putting information to a queue, whether it's um, single or pub, so pub or subbed or just pub to one. So can can do both. And then you've got event grid and event hub. So they're slightly different. So event grid is a, a reactionary eventing system. It is a model where it's actually pushed to the target. It's not polled or push pull like event hubs. And it does fan out, but it's not made as a streaming type service where that's what event hub is. So the beauty about event hub is when you're pushing in that information, so you're pushing in events, and I'll explain a bit more about events. When you're pushing in those into Event Hub, you can actually take it over into a streaming service such as Stream Analytics or Databricks or HD Insights and actually do streaming analysis over what that incoming data to look at it at real time. So you'll look at it and make decisions. And the classic one for Event Hub there, uh, I use this as a, a scenario, is if you've got a temperature sensor in a room, you're monitoring that room over a period of an hour and the temperature should be 23 degrees all the time. But what happens if the air conditioning fails in that room, the temperature starts to go up slowly, slowly. So you're looking at what's going on over time as, as that data is coming in and being streamed into Event Hub, into streaming analytics, you're able to see that sliding time window. So that's a good case for it. So looking at anomaly detection. So when the temperature goes too high in that room, you're able to then send an alert to, let's say, the security guard to come and actually have a look. Maybe you know, someone's opened the window and they shouldn't have, or someone's left the door open and all that colder air is actually um, leaving that room. So that's where event hubs comes into play when you need to do that analyzing over real time. Okay, so a bit more into depth of um, Service Bus. So Service Bus is just basically the Swift's army knife for messaging workloads. So it's built and does have queues and topics. And the difference here is that topics, you're able to send out that message to different subscribers and lots of them. So this is the, that's the classic pub sub. And if anyone's looking at building a solution with queues and topics, I always say go for a topic, start off with one subscriber, which is basically what a queue will give you. But then you don't have to rebuild anything. You just start adding more subscribers and the filtering at the end, and therefore you're getting the pub sub basically and all the efforts done. So it's quite used quite often for low leveling so i have scenarios where there are still some legacy platforms in the back end on prem that are already at high cpu and don't want to overload them but there's app modernization happening and they need to use those back end services so with queues you're able to do that low leveling and control how much goes back to your back end and you do that loose coupling so it provides that safety for that type of uh, load leveling where you don't need spiky workloads you need to control because of back-end systems so it's a very good use case in there event grid so event grid is a large-scale eventing system it is actually azure wide the Azure platform itself does use Event Grid to push out. So if you want to monitor for changes done by someone in the Azure subscription that you're um, looking after, you can use Event Grid there because it ties into there as well. So it you know, makes you think about event-driven architectures. And then I'll explain events a little later. So using these, you can build these kind of event-based serverless apps and it allows you just uh, to think about what code to write and you just tie up those events coming into there so and that's the third point on my slide here 
is it allows you to focus on product innovation. You don't need to think about putting all this stuff together because all you now really do is just tie it up together declaratively and then you run your code. It makes it much easier. Event Hub, one of my favorites, is actually it's, it's event-based streaming. It's multi-protocol, so it allows obviously AMP, AMQP, sorry, and Kafka. So there's um, it's, uh, Kafka compliance as well to 1.0. I believe that we're making progress to go even further than that. But it's good for consolidating and collating events in real time. So how does an event hub differ from a service bus and the best analogy i give to everyone who asks me this is think of a cassette tape now i hope there's people know what a cassette tape is actually i have one i should have brought it with me to show you what a cassette tape looks like in case anyone doesn't know a cassette tape so it records a stream just like a tape so it's going and it records on the reel the recording moves forward only so keep that in mind. It's, that's how the stream, because the data is coming in and it's being recorded. The cassette tape actually has a left and right channel. Okay, so when you're starting to capture your data, you're capturing them into both channels. You can replay the tape over and over again. So that's the good thing about streaming. You can go back to a certain point in time and read it again, or the whole, up to you. You can read it over and over again, up to, obviously, you define how much you want to re retain, but you can keep that. The important thing to know about the data in each of those channels, it can be different. Just like you have a left and right on a cassette tape, um, it's stereo. The audio that's recorded on the tape in the different channel is different, just the same as in an event hub. In an event hub, it's not called an audio channel, it's called a partition. But keep that in mind. So um when you're retrieving the data out of a particular partition you will be getting different data in the different partitions and now that's good and bad obviously it's a point to keep in mind when you're designing the architecture you do want multiple processes to read the data as quickly as possible therefore lots of partitions but then you need the endpoint which is where you're going to be processing the data to um, you've got to be watch out for other things such as, um, you know, is this out of order? Well, then you have to think about, well, something needs to be in a sequence that, well, it has to always go into a particular partition. So it's guaranteed. These are all architectural considerations. Now, events or messages. So this is a quick summary of it. So uh, the best way I think of an event is just a lightweight notification of something, of a change. So an event, like on a sensor for temperature, is I'm at 24 degrees, this is the time, this is my ID, and that's about it. It's small, discreet, doesn't have a lot of, it's not a big payload. And the other part here is that event gets sent, and there's no expectation of that sender to have any acknowledgement or any idea of how that data gets handled. That's an important thing. Now, that brings up a problem. When you're sending your data down through events to a downstream system, you might get the temperature sensor, for example, with its ID, and this is the temperature. But you have, as in the downstream system, has no idea where that temperature sensor is located. It's not as part of the payload. So it has to go look up data. So becomes a bit of a problem and this is it can be solved and i've got it in here it's called event carried state transfer it's a pattern it's relatively new where you're actually enriching the actual payload of the event with that information that you want as it's going down into the system so yes the data becomes larger but it becomes easier for the end systems to actually process the data because it's been enriched along the way Whereas an event, when we compare it to it, it's the data of something that's to be done. So if you're sending an event of an order, it's got all the order details. Sorry, sorry, it's got a message of an order. It's got all the order details. The payload 
is complete and goes through. But different to an event, it has an expectation that whoever's getting it will know what to do with it and the person sending it has an expectation of a response. Okay, so that's three important things. And I've got the link here for everyone to follow through on what the comparison is. And I've just taken a quick um, snapshot of that information. So what I went through, which is Event Grid, Event Hubs, and Service Bus, here are the key use cases. So obviously, Service Bus, it's a message, and you use it for order processing financial transactions. So classic e-commerce type thing, I would recommend a message over an event. But if you're looking at the other example that I was using, which was a IoT sensor for temperature, then I would be started looking at this kind of telemetry kind of data that I need to know. And I'm able to then to do that streaming analytics over it. So keep those in mind when you're designing your solutions. Okay, so little segue to the next part is I get asked quite often, what are the common integration patterns and what should we be looking out for? And these are the four ones that we see as the most common. So application and software as a service integration, integrating services, systems and people. So that's uh, real-time apps, obviously, dare I say my mobile phone. And our all-time favorite of BizTalk migration. So what's happening? Yes, BizTalk is still there. We all know. But you know, what can we do with BizTalk if we don't want to keep BizTalk anymore? So the first one, um, it's a way of basically connecting your own apps and other third-party apps, putting them together. Usually when a company is in this particular scenario, they've got existing on-premise systems over here where my mouse is showing and also other generically put data repositories. So they need to be joined some way and somehow together into uh, a new integration. So by putting these together, you can use logic apps, functions, put them through, join all this information. If there has to be a composition with uh, event hub or event grid with service bus, you can put that into place. But the benefit here is that you're able to do this with the logic apps to build those workflows and those code um, to, to actually talk to those backend systems and bring them together then you're able to expose that information with APIM to provide you a, a facade, it's a nice uh, technical term, a design pattern called facade, where you're actually able to expose those out to other places. And this is the beauty, because you can use these together, you're able to resilience by putting the decoupling with queues, and other functions that are specific to little parts of the jobs. So microservice oriented design rather than a large monolith and you put them together. So you're basically, again, classic scenario, whole bunch of Azure services put together to bring out an integration solution. There's no need to look at complex code heavy type solutions. You can use all of these in any way that seems fit for what the problem is at hand. Some companies love to use lots of code, so an Azure function will be useful. Other companies are doing this from scratch and not migrating. It's greenfield, so they will take advantage of a whole bunch of connectors available for logic apps. Look at the solution in hand that you're trying to achieve and then look at how these services can be used together. And it's a very common use case. Again, very much similar, but this one is allowing a bit more of that citizen developer 
where we're putting out all that information through APIM to allow the power platform to actually get access to this data. So combination here of lots of developer style apps, but allowing the citizen developer within the organization to take advantage of those exposed backend services in a controlled manner to allow them to build something meaningful. So there is a classic use case of Heathrow Airport that did something along these lines where the security guard was doing his audits on Heathrow Terminal and taking a long time because they had to fill out paperwork. So they fill out the paperwork, they go back to the computer terminal and enter it in all over again. So they sat down and came up with a power app which took all that information and fed it back into the back-end system. So as the security guard was doing his or her rounds, looking at the condition and the state of the security of the terminal, they weren't capturing this on a piece of paper. They were just writing it and answering the questions directly in that Power App. Classic integration, but citizen developer had the problem that needed to be solved. The security guard, of all people, you know, you wouldn't expect them to be IT savvy, but classic scenario, business-led problem that needed to be solved. Someone who was savvy enough to actually go and um, take the challenge onto themselves and come up with that power up. So it's becoming more and more, more common now. Obviously, real-time applications, we're very familiar with our phones. My phone, I'll put it this way. So they're all real time, but all this telemetry as well is not just from a phone on what we're doing. There's IoT sensors like I always use, manufacturing, going through manufacturing um, plants and actually checking items being um, created and scanned as they're going through. So dare I say a classic example is uh, couriers and delivery and all those parcels that are being delivered around the world. This is where these type of apps come in and it's actually quite common as you, you probably know that during the last two years, the amount of courier deliveries has just gone through the roof. So those are the types of solutions that those companies are building and they're taking advantage of our event hubs, getting all that information in there and actually making sure there's no anomalies or any um, defects on the actual labeling and they're doing that now with optical character recognition as well and checking the code so that barcode's on there even if it's smudged they're trying to read it properly so it gets routed to the right place so there's no time lost in actually shipping it and then obviously um, these are lots of systems that need to be integrated so from it arriving to a particular location it then needs to be sent off to another from this distribution center there's different systems that to be involved and here again introducing a service bus to do that pub sub to actually reliably deliver the messages to other systems is very important to make sure obviously you want that parcel with your um fancy new um computer or Apple Watch or whatever it might be, you want that delivered as quickly as possible. So um, reliability is the key here as well. So quite a very common use case. Okay, and my last one that I'll talk about is BizTalk. Now, there was 20 years of BizTalk, <laughs> dare I say, um, it is at the heart of a lot of customers that are using this and there's some are even upgrading right now because realizing that old versions of BizTalk are becoming end of life. Even the OS that they're running is end of life. So uh, what, do, what do we do? It's actually a common decision. Do we continue with the BizTalk platform or do we modernize and migrate to Azure integration services? So when we're talking about BizTalk migration to Azure, we're looking at the Migrator tool. So um, it was over a year ago that we had a talk in this 
forum on how to run and debug these scenarios. If um, uh, Bill's still on the line, you'd probably be cursing that um, or calling this out, but he did this over a year ago. <laughs> so, um, yes, I think it's time to um, look at this again because it's going to become a bit more popular now that um, Windows Server 2012 is EOL and SQL Server yep. 2012 is EOL. So... The uh, interesting thing they've done, John, is that they've also, they're working on um, the standard Logic App integration into the migrator. So that'll make, that will make it a little bit easier. Correct. So watch this space. Now, I have my awesome demo, demo time. Just check my time. I've got time. Cool. Very good. So... Now, my scenario. So this is the same scenario that I um, presented at the user group, obviously, um, changed slightly because now I'm presenting at the world's best integration user group. So what I want to do is, I this is Joe, he wants to do this but he wants to check sentiment analysis. So while people are tweeting this, whatever it might be, whatever hashtag and app we're doing, Joe wants to grab that information and actually receive a summary of the sentiment. Okay, so this is how the solution is overall. Now, this solution didn't come straight away. So I'll have to admit there were some pitfalls and I'll explain the pitfalls in more detail because that's quite important because when you're sitting here designing something, you're going, oh, I should be able to do this like that. Should be able to and are able to work slightly different. And this is what I'll go through here now. So I have my logic app, which is looking at and calls an Azure function to get the tweets for the last minute. Now, that was my first problem. Why would I do that? And the reason is the connector. So the takeaway, I'll say it up front, is when you're designing a solution and you need to use the connectors, put them together in your design on a whiteboard or a piece of paper, then go check the connector documentation on what its capabilities are. For this particular case, when I'm using Logic Apps Standard, the connector for Twitter could only poll once an hour. That might be fine in a real enterprise environment where you go every hour, get all the tweets, shove them into Cosmos DB, for example, or, or check the sentiment analysis and then put them into Cosmos DB. That makes sense. But in this demo environment, the whole talk is for one hour, so that resolution of one minute didn't quite work. So the only way for me to do that is to actually write a small Azure function that will actually call the Twitter REST API to get those tweets and then give it back to the Logic App. So keep that in mind. That's where one of my gotchas was. So we get all the tweets. The Logic App's got a array of tweets. So for each one of those, it goes and calls cognitive services and asks for the sentiment. And we'll get the sentiment uh, positive, neutral, negative. And with that enriched payload, it'll store them into Cosmos DB. Now, for this demo, I'm not storing the entire tweet. Excuse me, not the tweet. I'm taking the entire tweet text. But I'm only capturing the author ID. I'm not capturing the author, so I'm not enriching it. So remember how I said about um, the um, event state transfer pattern? You can take that data and enrich it, which would make more sense. I want to know who wrote the tweet, whether it's good or bad. So keep that in mind. When you need to enrich that part of that data, in this case, I didn't. So I'll grab that author ID, the ID of the tweet, the text, the date it was created, and the sentiment, and put it into Cosmos DB. So I've got my store. Perfect. Now, how do I get the information summarized? Because I don't want 
a message on Twilio being sent to my mobile every time there's a tweet. I only The use case here is to receive it once a minute. So this is where we use change feeds of Cosmos DB. So we have an Azure function that's listening on the change feed. So every time there is a tweet saved in a particular container, the Azure function will fire and put that sentiment in a queue. And then we'll process it with another log uh, function and then update a different collection in Cosmos DB with that summary. There's a special name to this pattern and this is why I used it. It's called materialized view. It's similar to the database terms of materialized view. If you're familiar with how Oracle and SQL Server use materialized view, um, similar approach. So what it's doing is, is, obviously I have a collection just as every single tweet that's coming in. It's been just stored and the, the actual collect container is getting larger and larger because all the tweets are being fed in. But my summary, I just want to know 10 were positive, 12 were neutral, 100 were negative. I only want that summary and I want that summary to remain as it is. It doesn't have to change. And this is where this pattern comes in quite handy. And that's why I put it in here because uh, as apps dev guys, as well as integration, we'll see that we need to do some little tricks. And I, I find this actually quite impressive. So that's where this comes in. Now, the last bit, of course, there is no Twitter and SMS integration. So I'm using Twilio. That's a connector out of the box. All I needed to do was sign up, get the, the auth key and the code, and shove it into the connector while I was actually authoring it and put it into place and up and running I was. Now, there is um, Azure Communication Services that's able to do SMSs. Um, at the moment, it's not fully available. Uh, so there are some places where you can't use it, but it's another alternative. Again, look at the requirements and build the solution there. So in this case, Twilio, perfect. I uh, put it in there just to say, because it's a third party. And I'll say, okay, you don't have everything. Azure, we've got Twitter and Twilio, the TWs. So how do we put all this together? Oops, I don't want the thank you slide yet. Okay, let's get out of here. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of resources in a resource group. So I've got all of it together. So let's go into the logic apps. If you remember the architecture for the logic apps, the key one was getting that Twitter feed. You actually grab it in by calling the Azure function. So let's have a look. So I've got it in the designer. So this is deployed. And what I also showed in the Azure Global Days is there's two approaches to actually writing a logic app. One is to write it in the workflow designer that's available, as you can see, in the Azure portal. Uh, here's the, the workflow. And then in Visual Studio, you can do the same. So there's the, my Visual Studio, and hopefully it's coming through clearly. There's my workflow. If I click on it, there it is in JSON. Now, it's not so pretty, but if I go right click and open in Designer, give it a moment, and we will see. There it is. Uh, looks mighty familiar except that it's the other way around so if we go back to the actual json in the azure sorry the design in, it's just this branch is flipped the other way around so you get two places to actually build it so up to you so the reason why i say do it in visual studio code is because you do get this json uh, what's so beautiful about it? It's the representation of it, and therefore you can put it into source control. You can put it into Git. So that way, where there are organizations that actually say everything has to be GitOps, and or therefore DevOps, you have, in this case, the logic app, and I've got it in here, as you can see, logic apps and all my artifacts. I have my 
infrastructure as code. I'm actually um, uh, driving myself crazy and doing this with the Azure AZ CLI. Um, so, um, you know, torture onto myself to get it to work. And it's actually um, quite long, but it's very, very possible. You can use ARM template and bicep. So this is the beauty of it, as well as I've got my Azure functions in code. So if I do my sentiment summary, here it is. You see, it's just code and it's one Visual Studio Code project that does both. That's the beauty of it. Now, back to the Azure portal, because everything's just here. As you can see, it's calling this Azure function every minute. And this is the hashtag that is calling. And this is a function I write myself. And I can quite it clearly show you how that one works. We've got time. So where are we? There we are. Let's bring it up. So all it's doing is making a call out to the actual endpoint of the HTTP feed for Twitter the base address that I pass in and all the query parameters that are required. And then it actually goes and calls it. So it makes that call. Let me highlight the line, these two lines here, it makes the call. And this client is just a HTTP client. So I'm actually writing the code. This is what the connector would have done if it could work, but unfortunately couldn't. And I've got a little bit of fancy code here to handle the next token. So it only gets a certain amount of results at one time, which you can see up here if I'll make it a little larger. Oh, I can't make it larger. Um, 100 at a time. So it's able to cater for that next. So if there's more than 100 tweets, it's able to get them. And this is the whole code. All it's doing and just returning me that result. So it's calling this based on these parameters I'm passing in, parsing it. Now, very common in the old days of BizTalk, we can put um, responses and terminate in BizTalk. We can do this as well. And there's this lovely little red. And what does that mean? It has failed. So this is one of the beauty about Logic Apps is that you can actually say when a particular part of a flow works and doesn't. So this terminate will work when parsing the JSON has failed. And this terminate, I've said it's going to do succeeded, I can actually say failed. So that way I'll end the logic app with a failure status on the overview when something goes wrong. So all I'm doing here, grabbing all of them, sorry, a little too far there, getting the sentiment, which is just calling the connector, putting in the document ID of the tweet, the text of the tweet. And when they're coming out, I'm saving it into Cosmos DB in this format. As I said, author created the ID, the text, and the sentiment of it. So just shoving into um, Cosmos DB. So as it's going in there, and here is what you see. You can see, and I'll just do a refresh. I don't, I don't even know how many records I've got in there. So I've got lots. Let's have a look at this one. So we can see author ID created the text and the sentiment, none. So this is when I was early playing on with the, the logic app and negative. So this one has a negative sentiment. Well, see, a game where everything goes wrong. Well, sort of, yes, that sort of makes sense. It's a negative sentiment. So all that information goes in. So what about the return path, which I said it goes into Cosmos gets picked up by the Azure function and put into a service bus queue. Now, I'll just quickly show you what that little part is. Whoops, go back to Visual Studio Code. So it's the change feed processor function, Very, super simple. And that's the whole code. All it's doing is it has a Cosmos DB trigger and puts it into a service bus. So all it's doing is for every tweet that's coming in, obviously I'm converting it to a typed object, creating a new service bus message of it with just the sentiment. Uh, you know, as the analytics that I need later don't need more than that detail, I'm just sending the sentiment into the service bus message. That's all. 
and I'm just sending it. So away, off it goes into service bus. Now, let's have a look. Will I be able to see any of them in there while we're going? Let's do a refresh, or unless this is working too quickly. I don't see any being active. I think they're all being processed out already. But it goes into here. If we go into the Service Bus Explorer, hopefully I can catch some coming in. Okay, so let's have a peek. Uh, I don't see any because it's still saying active of zero. So it's actually, yep, no. Let's see if I can pick the dead letter one that weren't able to be sequence number one. Yeah, well, okay, the first message. Didn't get delivered. That's fine. So sentiment, none. So then it goes to the next step, that little processor function to grab all these sentiments and save it into here. So that was an Azure function. I should stay in Visual Studio Code. So this sentiment summary. So all it's doing is receiving that sentiment and checking back my sentiment summary document in Cosmos DB. So this is where the materialized view pattern comes in. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I'll go quickly through it. Um, so a materialized view in Cosmos, and I'll show you what it looks like, is in this case, an already predefined view of the data. So obviously I've got the typical Cosmos DB stuff in there, but I've made this thing being content. And in here, it's got all the sentiments and the counts. So it's already summarized. And this is all it is. It's that one record in the container that's just kept in there with all that information. And if I go and refresh it and then click on it again, these values should change. Yep, because they're increasing because the apps are, the whole solution is still running. So this is what it's doing. It's keeping this running. So this content doesn't, well, it shouldn't change these dictionaries, but the code, excuse me, the code's able as well to actually add stuff in there. So this is what this part is doing. It's just checking, well, there only really should be one record, so hence why there's this break down there. So it's just getting there, checking, okay, if the record doesn't have that content, we'll create that content as a dictionary. And we check if that dictionary has the sentiment in there. So none, neutral, positive. We'll go back and double check there. None, neutral, negative, mixed, positive. If that doesn't exist, then we'll add it with one because this is the first one. Or if it does exist, we'll take that and just increment it by one and then we just replace the existing document and then complete the message um, so when we're completing the message it just basically means that we've taken the peak lock read it finished processing the message and saying complete which will tell service bus hey service bus i'm finished with what i'm processing with this message you may remove it from the queue and no one else will get it and that's what this is that that's the statement that you put in there so off it goes so it's coming all the way back down to cosmos and cosmos db and if i can refresh we should see I did refresh try again oh no, nothing's been changed since okay which is quite oh yes here we go it did change i'm just too quick so a few more neutrals went up by two more. So that is how it works. It keeps that one record. Now, the beauty about having one record like this as a materialized view, it's a point read, which is important for Cosmos DB programming because a point read takes the least number of resource units required to read it. It's lightweight, okay? You're updating one document, which is, you know, as long as this document's really, really small, it goes very, very small in the IUs and updating it as well. So the beauty about that, it keeps your charges low for Cosmos DB. So um, it's not a heavyweight thing. So that's what the beauty about this 
keeping it like that. So that's the return path. We have our data back in Cosmos DB, obviously back in our logic apps. I'll just go send the sentiment to Twilio. So all it does again is in the designer. In this case, I've actually turned off my Twilio. It's not sending it to Twilio. It's just running and reading it. Okay, it's taking a bit longer than I expected. Okay, if it takes too long, I'll slot. Uh, it's taking a bit long. Okay, send sentiment to Twilio. Let's just open up in design in Visual Studio Code. And this is where the demo gods aren't so happy. Oh, they are. So, yes, every minute, query Cosmos DB. I've got a, a variable summary there. Set it from the information from the body of that. And then um, this is, I've got this little variable sent to Twilio, true or false. I've actually got it set to false at the moment. So, it will just follow the false path. But otherwise, send a text message to my mobile of that sentiment summary and that's what it'll do so if we if the uh, call the portal has completed actually see if there's any latest runs and we'll see what the data is so this one ran oh not so long ago so let's just get that run history and just show you what it looks like so it's gone through here, go there, and this wait for it to show. So I'll just go into raw, and you'll just see this is the info that I'll be, be receiving every minute, which is the sentiment summary. So none, 48, neutral, etc. So this is the information that I'll be receiving based on that whole loop. So Joe will be receiving his bit of information on sentiment, on how his talk is going, and he'll have a, a ready reckoner of what's going on. If he's, well, so far, Joe's been very neutral. Uh, looks like more negative than positive. Poor Joe, his talk didn't go so well, but he at least gets an idea of what's going on. So in my talk, I went through all of these, and I'll just bring back my... presentation of what I went through. So the logic app, calling out the function, obviously design choice, I had to make that. So this is a revised architecture, if you want to call it, of what actually had to happen. And goes into Cosmos DB and uses this materialized view pattern. Now, in transparency, this is not my first choice either for the way I wanted the actual sentiments to come through. I wanted the information to come through and be sent to streaming analytics. So, so that means the logic app will be sending it to an event hub, an event hub doing the stream analytics over that information coming over, over the time window every minute and then sending a summary of what happened through to Twilio. So obviously we're going via a service bus and then sending it out or directly to a function to send it out. That was, but I had a challenge when I was going through streaming analytics and then putting the message into service bus. So for every sentiment that you saw, so you saw that there were five sentiments. Joe didn't want to receive a message for each sentiment in this value. He just wanted the summary. So he wanted none, as we can see, we go back to um, the output. None was 48. Neutral was that. Joe didn't want to receive one message for this, then another message for neutral, and another message for negative. So the architecture back here, if I'd use streaming analytics, streaming analytics will put a message per sentiment into the service bus queue. So at that point in time, for that sliding window of one minute, if there was one none and five positive, you would get two messages rather than the one being the summary of that actual information that's coming through. So keep that in mind as a gotcha. I found out the hard way when I implemented it. So 
in full transparency, this is the third iteration of what I was trying to present in the um, global days because of that little gotcha. I wasn't aware of that. So a bit of trial and error got me there. So with that, I am five minutes over. So I thank you. Really appreciate you having me. So um, floor's open for any questions or any more info that you'd like me to um, present back to everyone. At the moment, we don't have any questions out there, but that was very good. I, that was some uh, some stuff that um, I've been playing with recently, so it was good to see. And I think it's going to be a good one for people to view on the YouTube channel because uh, it covers a lot of those things. Um, and the it's interesting because I've looked at a couple of the BizTalk migrations, and that migrator is just a little bit heavy for a, some of the things. So uh, I know they were... Uh, the um, the guy that's done a lot of the development work on the migrator um, was saying they were looking at a, a lighter weight version of some of that migration stuff too. Yeah, yeah. My experience with the migrator, it's very heavy. It it over engineers the output. Um, one thing they did, they were working on, I don't know where they're at with it, but they were looking at it so you could specify your own things like API management and app config and things like that. So they didn't create those every time. You were going to be able to specify your own instance so that it didn't go off and create those. So, um, And one interesting trick when you were do showing your um, creating your Azure artifacts with your CLI, um, I found a neat one is you can actually export the ARM template. And then there's a tool out on the web that will allow you to convert your ARM template to bicep so that you can stick it into your project as a bicep template. So, which uh, I yeah, found yeah. pretty handy um, with that. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I decided to be a bit masochistic and try with um, AZ CLI. <laughs> um, yeah, I know that uh, I got to the very end and I'm going, oh, I've got to create the, uh, the connections. I'm going, oh, okay, how do you do that? Oh, it's just a, you know, it's a website connection, um, but uh, a very, very limited set of AZ CLI commands for yep. um, creating and connections. It, it's one of the things that we've been complaining about a bit because the documentation for, on web connections is shall we say, almost non-existent. <laughs> it gives you the base, but it doesn't give you where all of the neat little bits of information that you need go. So, yeah, it's been one of those things that you need to work on. So, yeah, connect, thank you very much again. Are the, uh, um, are the key. What's that? Connectors are the key that, uh, you know, they need to be finessed each time. Yeah, well, on the I mean, time. we got in this discussion a little while ago about the fact that a lot of them were built for the power automate where yeah. you're are you're interactive so putting in your oauth credentials and things like that is how they were designed but then when you take that to logic apps and you want to deploy it with devops creating an oauth credential is a pain so hopefully some of the um managed identity stuff is going to come through but and I understand their problem is that the managed identity lives in the Azure AD. It the yeah. it doesn't really have visibility to the off the Microsoft 365 directory for Office and Teams and all those kind of things. So there's a there's a little bit of a gray area there of how they're going to connect all those things together. So, but thank you very much again, John. Um, it was good. And anybody else got any questions? If not, I will um, end the live broadcast. Yeah, just awesome job, John. Yeah, thanks, John. You're most welcome. Yeah, no, really good.